It's at that point that I would have not wrecked the car. I would have been like, you know what? You got a point there. <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Yowza! And from Music Video Sins, Barrett Share. Yeah. I actually saw Guns N' Roses live yeah. earlier this week. You said they started right on time, too. They started immediately at 7 p.m. That's, that's awesome. And there's a lot of yowzas at the end of songs in Appetite for Destruction. Really? So I've, I've heard, including Jeremy's, I've heard a lot of yowzas. <laughs> Interesting. You should go to the uh, website that sees how many yowzas are on in movies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which movie has the most yowzas? <laughs> yeah. I mean, End of Watch beats Goodfellas on fucks, but the, how, where does it rank as far as yowzas are concerned? I remember a lot of yowzas. Yeah. And good fellas. Um, but uh, you know, today we're gonna be talking about uh, we're gonna define the decade, this time 1980s. Where we're going, we don't need roads. I'm a friend of Sierra Connor. Egon, your mucus. Go man, your Jordans are fucked up. You lost that love and feeling. I love you. I know. Now you wanna get nuts? Come on! Let's get nuts. Yeah. And I'm sure it'll be a lot like the the sort of discussion we had with the 70s one where we look at movies made in the 80s as compared to what we're seeing now. Mm. And um, in the uh, last podcast, I said the 80s were like the 70s vomit. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, You can see so many movies trying to be those movies from the 70s. Uh, Animal House... Uh, and and Blues Brothers, even though it was 1980, sort of begat this huge amount of like comedies. These you know these um, everybody needs to get laid comedies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, either it was about uh, someone who was uh, like a virgin, like in Losing It. You had Tom Cruise and Risky Business. You had Tom yeah. Cruise. <laughs> yeah. um, Tom Cruise simply could not get laid just, in the 80s. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you have a face like that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough. It's so so hard. And then so and then you had Porky's and you had uh, the Revenge of the Nerds yeah. and all these movies that were sort of inspired by the Animal House and Blues Brothers. And again, Blues Brothers was 1980. 1980 is still kind of 70s though like raging yeah. bull came out in 1980 um raging bull was still kind of a product of the 70s the shining came out in 80 the shining yeah, yeah. uh so you have you have in that 1980 year there's some at least whatever i think it really starts becoming 80s though by 81 because you've got raiders of the lost ark mm-hmm. et comes out in 82 so you're getting that sort of that influence of lucas and spielberg from yeah. the 70s and at least they kind of keep it keep it going somewhat, I guess. Yeah. Empire Strikes Back is another 1980, another 1980 movie that was still, I think, a 70s kind of movie. Yeah. But then once it got to 83, Return of the Jedi is 80s as fuck. Yes, it oh, is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so in, in those Indiana Jones movies are, you know, I mean, the Raiders of the Lost Ark is is very much an 80s, what we'd see in the 80s. Oh, and, yeah. And, and, and all those Indiana Jones movies are. Uh, so uh, that's a general beginning, but what else do we know from the eighties that, uh, that we, that we remember? The first thing I thought of was cause, well, cause last episode we tried to sort of say, well, who, who owned this decade more than anyone? And I think we settled on Coppola. Yes. Mm-hmm. Not Coppola. That's right. right. <laughs> and I, my first thought here was John Hughes. Okay. Um, because this, this decade is the ballooning of the romantic comedy yep. teen you know angsty um kind of thing but but i almost immediately thought well spielberg man mm-hmm. like because spielberg had had his i'm on the scene in the 70s with jaws and close encounters but in the 80s you know you got the indiana jones movies he's an executive producer of the back to the future films right. uh, et and this is really where i think he became spielberg in this decade Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He's dominant in this decade. It's interesting though, in a way, in his his movies that he directed, you have you have the Indiana Jones movies, you have E. T. Everything aside from that though was greeted either lukewarm by critics or it was considered good 
but like it was there was something else about it that they couldn't like the color purple mm-hmm. and everybody was sort of you know spielberg is taking this story that we love that this book that we love and he's changed a lot of parts of it that we didn't you know that we that we liked and empire of the sun was him it seemed like he was very much trying to get the oscar and yeah. everything if you ever watch that uh spielberg documentary that's going on right now on hbo uh they talk a lot about that mm. like uh, he felt like that criticism was unfair but I, I i feel like it's a come on you really were trying to get the oscar with these movies i mean i think a lot of people were i guess some critics were upset that he was trying to do serious quote unquote unquote movies serious movies when he had been doing all this wonder and spectacle and everything like sort of a how dare you type mm-hmm. of criticism but uh i i don't have any problem with somebody going for the oscar i just think that it's so it's so like it in, in your work it shows that mm-hmm. you're trying to get that oscar sure. you're, you're, you're you make all these shots real epic and you, you know you're like it's a serious subject matter and all that and it scores as he in uh, the aviator basically right? yeah, like, yeah 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 you I'm gonna can... hit all of the the check boxes that the academy you know biopic big performances big scope and stuff like that well and it's even kind of like like old hollywood because there's so many real actors and actresses from that era in the aviator that he bumps into or dates or what have yeah. you hollywood always loves that yep yeah and uh and i would i would almost i mean it starts off very well for spielberg and as a producer yes he's got he's he has his fingers and everything in that in that decade um and it and et is one of the single reasons why i'm a big movie fan was because mm. i saw that when i was five yeah uh the rest of that decade you can argue is kind of uh, uneven for him even though i love the color purple and i love i love uh the last crusade and all that it's really i don't think it's really until the 90s that spielberg really hits another gear hmm. um but uh you could argue this is still his decade but i like the john hughes thing better it feels like that is what most people would think of when you when you define the 80s to me breakfast club mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right um, I mean, he made a lot of other movies. Yeah, back Ferris in the 80s. Bueller's Day Off, uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Pretty in uh, Pink, Pretty and Pink. Sixteen Candles. These movies are, yeah, are the go tos when you think about the eighties, and and it, sometimes it seems like, strangely enough, like E. T. and Indiana Jones and all those don't even seem part of the decade. Really, it's kind of, I don't know, they're completely. <laughs> well, it's because yeah, because Indiana Jones is set in such a different universe and different time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's more ageless. What's interesting is that you can make a good case that Harrison Ford owned this decade. Yeah. Because between he worked every he had a movie come out every year except for 1987, and then 88 he had two movies come mm-hmm. out. Uh, but I mean his entire run I'm discounting Crystal Skull, but his entire run of Indiana Jones happened in the 80s. Han Solo happened in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, Blade Runner, I know we got mixed opinions on, but yep. that, that was certainly and like a big performance. His Working own, Girl. It was his only Oscar nomination, too, for Witness. Yeah, Witness mm-hmm. and, and Frantic. Like, he, he yep. had a big-ass decade here. Yeah, he, did. he really did. And he was, I'm pretty sure, the biggest movie star at this point in the 80s. Like, almost everything was gold. Yeah. And he didn't, he didn't, he had a streak there for, for the most part. I mean, obviously, some hit or miss there here and there but uh he he was as he was as sure of a draw as anybody has ever been all the way up until like 1994 or five or something like that once he did six days seven nights i think people (laughs) were like okay we don't have to watch you and everything (laughs) we don't have to watch you and everything yeah i mean look at this right i'll just just real quick uh, in 80, he did uh, Empire Strikes Back, 81, Raiders of the Lost Ark, 82, Blade Runner, 83, Return of the Jedi, 84, Temple of Doom, 85, Witness, 86, Mosquito Coast, which I think uh, Jeremy I think liked, about right? you when I go to the bathroom. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not, I'm not saying it's good. It's a weird-ass fucking movie. Uh, Peter I Weir movie. because uh, River Phoenix was in. Peter Weir movie. Oh, Mosquito yeah. Mosquito Coast. Right. Uh, and then Frantic and Working Girl in 88, and then uh, Last Crusade in 89. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's a fucking great run. Impeccable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing, of course, there are exceptions to the rule, but it feels like in general, the 80s looked at the 70s and said, let's go away from the dirt and grime and crime and let's just try and be as happy as possible. Mm. So this is really when our buddy cop action comedy movies. Yes, were uh, they were so prevalent. They oh, my everywhere. God. And it almost it almost lasted well into the 90s that you, you, you couldn't really 
go a month without a major buddy cop action comedy yeah. coming yeah. out. But it started with Lethal Weapon mm -hmm. and Beverly Hills Cop and 48 Hours. And it just uh, it really kind of set the stage for what action movies were going to be for at least 15 It was years. always you have to pair usually, hopefully, in the studio's eyes, a white guy with a black guy. Yeah. That was the yeah. that was their One differences. Funny. Yeah. That was their differences. Right. And 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 so then they you know they they in the nineties it started getting they started changing it up a bit quote unquote right. with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker and Rush Hour and and uh, and stuff like that. Uh, the funny thing about you bringing up but this is a really good genre to pick up bring up because no they don't make this shit anymore no no not if at you want to like talk about uh what how we relate to the 80s today they don't make buddy cop movies anymore um they everything that's action these days is generally either one man or it is a comic book movie Mm. Or it's uh, like a Fast and Furious Expendables kind of like yeah team up thing. yeah they have to have like a billion people yeah. in it and and everything so yeah I mean you won't see this like two people I, mean, I guess in a way you have um you have Ride Along is kind of one of these buddy cop type of movies even though Central Intelligence yeah Central <laughs> well, I was Intelligence just gonna say Central you, what you get today is a PG thirteen watered down much more cliche but. Most of these '80s action buddy cops we're talking about were rated R, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and for a good reason. Yeah. And and you know through the '90s and that age of political correctness, I think we and of course the PG-13 rating, we started seeing a lot more of that edge come off in the '90s and the 2000s of whatever buddy cop comedies we get. But the only reason we have the other guys mm -hmm. is because we had so much yeah. buddy cop stuff for them to parody. Yeah. So the other uh, guys and the nice guys. Yeah, uh, but, I was watching The Nice Guys this morning, knowing we were going to come down here and talk about this, and I was thinking, how different is this movie? Yeah. Like, it's almost, it's set in the 70s, not the 80s, but it's almost the same era as, like, A Lethal Weapon or Beverly Hills Cop, but mm -hmm. it's played completely different. Like, they just don't make them like that anymore. Exactly, and that's how, that's why those two were successful, at least comedically and critically, is because they didn't have to take off that edge we're not saying that you have to put boatloads of violence or profanity or nudity or whatever in your movie to make it funny or good. But when you have that license to do that in the other guys and the nice guys in particular, that's what makes them stand out from something like fucking central intelligence or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, yeah. he's creepy. He likes to do anal and stuff. Don't <laughs> don't say in stuff. <laughs> Just say anal. <laughs> You're here with hookers and stuff. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's a, such a that's, man that was so prevalent back then. It it's was crazy to think about how we don't get those anymore. Like there was Tango and Cash, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, and later Turner and Hooch, yeah, Turner and Hooch. But uh, what else in the eighties do we remember? Tim Burton, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the best the, of Tim Burton, the golden era of Tim Burton, like mm -hmm. kind of his. He probably made something in the 70s that I never saw. But, yeah, this no, is he really did start in the 80s. He was a Disney animator or okay. something like that for a while. And then and then he did his, uh, his short Frankenweenie. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it was it led into Big Top Pee-wee and all that. Not Big Top Pee-wee. Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Edward Scissorhands. Big Top Pee-wee. God, <laughs> what a terrible Pee-wee movie. Uh, but Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Those um, movies. We, we talk When we talk about Tim Burton, we usually talk about how far he's lost his way today. Mm -hmm. But back in the 80s, this is when he's probably making his best shit right yeah i mean he makes ed wood in the 90s right that's probably his best his film very overall. best yeah but um you know he's also making mars attacks and he's kind of starting to veer into that yeah territory by this point it, but back in the 80s my wife was watching edward scissorhands the other day and i don't think she's seen it more than once or twice and it's just it's so cool it's so cool looking it's got so much heart for such a fucking crazy ass premise yeah um you know this is the best of this is when he sort of arrived if you will if spielberg arrived in the 70s tim burton arrived in the 80s and promptly stopped making good movies all that movies. all that wild and you know the, all the different colors and just the you know the the goofy stories and everything i feel like is another quintessential type of 80s thing like yeah. maybe maybe he got tired of that himself for the 90s but it could just be the way everything was changing like people were uh, I said enough to all this goofy zany zany stuff or whatever. Even though, yeah, he does do Mars Attacks um, later on, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I feel like that decade is is positioned to uh, take in Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands and that last Batman that the last year last year of the eighties Batman. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to sound too. I'm trying to sound smart, mm -hmm. 
But I mean, how much how much do you think the the cultural, I guess, mood of the country dictated the 80s and having such a a unique bent? Because this is the like the height of the Cold War. Right. So this is where when I'm in elementary school, I'm doing still doing some duck and cover type drills. Yeah. <laughs> St- we're still afraid that you know, Russia might nuke us mm-hmm. and maybe Hollywood thought we needed some more humor or maybe we really did. And that's why we flocked to these kind of movies. So they kept making them throughout the whole decade. But, you know, I, I feel like the 70s was still kind of angsty from Vietnam and mm. and even the war in Korea. And that kind of led to some of the grime and crime that we saw on screen. And by the 80s, maybe we're looking for more hope. We're not quite as angry anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think you could also there was a sense of subverting the norm that you could still get away with stuff. You certainly could get away with anything in the 70s. Mm-hmm. With the 80s, you know, you could take a, a, a silly comedy or action comedy and elevate it by throwing in some really dark humor or something like that. Like Heathers. Like Heathers, yeah, exactly. Even something like Porky's has, like, even though it's a, such a screwball movie, it's got some weird shit in there, too. Yeah. It's got some real moments where, like, one dude gets beaten almost to the point of death in that movie. Yeah. Um. So there was, there was just some, some kind of, yes, levity, but there's still, like... I could get away with some shit like something like Ghostbusters, where it's a straight up paranormal thriller that just happens to have some of the most talented comedians in the universe mm-hmm. working on it. Uh, and Essentially a miracle that it got made that way. Yeah. Uh, you had to have a, a, a whole bunch of events happen there. You had to have, you know, John Belushi die. Right. You had to have Eddie Murphy turn down the script. Um, I can't remember the reasons why. Too many K's in it. Too many K's. <laughs> too many K's. But he was supposed to play Winston, and uh, Winston was a bigger character at the time Interesting. when Eddie Murphy was a part of it. And then when Eddie Murphy dropped out, uh, they made Winston a smaller character. Are you um, sure they didn't make Winston a smaller character after they cast Ernie Hudson? Oh, that was me. <laughs> oh, no, it could be. Could be. Um, but, uh, but then, and then getting Bill Murray, which I, I don't think he was a part of the original cast because it was supposed to be Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, and Eddie Murphy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, and so then, you know, now you have Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, who was like not even supposed to be in this movie, right? Bill Murray and, and, uh, and er- Ernie Hudson. And it's, it's, a, I don't, how would that movie have played with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi? It would be. I still think there's got to be a it, it it would have been a classic, but not the classic we know. No, yeah, it would be different. Yeah, yeah. All, the, all the all the beats work in in Ghostbusters. It's it's one of my favorite movies ever, mm-hmm. uh, and it's still rewatchable even though the effects don't hold up. The effects hold up a little better than you would expect yeah. from from that period of time. But you know, there's a believable romance between Sigourney Weaver and uh, Bill Murray. Bill Murray is really at the top of his like. I don't give a fuck, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm still going to make you laugh type yeah. of mentality and performance. And it, it's weird that Dan Aykroyd is reduced to being basically like a, a tertiary character in mm-hmm. this. Um, Harold Ramis with his deadpan is, is perfect. Like that troupe, those those guys that came out of Second City or wherever in, in Canada too, like that always seemed to hit like land for me. Mm-hmm. Comedically... And just a movie watching experience, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and Ghostbusters is an, is another example of. I mean, I feel like that's it's. I love Ghostbusters, and I think it's still it's still timeless. But it's eighties as fuck. Yeah. You can't really make Ghostbusters the way you, and we've seen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've seen that very clearly. <laughs> uh, I mean, I feel like they could have made uh, better Ghostbusters, but I don't think they could have made the Ghostbusters they made back then. The, uh, it's another spectacle type of a movie like uh, it's very hard to get these special effects comedies like they tried to do it later on with a lot of other stuff with these you know tried to make ghostbuster style comedies but it just doesn't work mm-hmm. uh i think you have have to have this unique cast and and uh the way that movie is and everything they, um but yeah ghostbusters is 80s as fuck because that's the first time i really remember a a hit single being on the radio <laughs> yep uh, it's where they started marketing uh, the singles uh, from the movies as as big time hits. And you started seeing this uh, all the way throughout, like the mannequin song that, you know, that yeah. uh, that what's that song. How's that go? I had the record single of Axel F from. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the backside, it was the greatest American hero TV. 
be leaning or yeah. not, I'm walking on air. Yeah, I, never I love thought that song. It could be I used so free. that was on the the B side on the one I bought. Oh, that's, that's crazy. hilarious. But yeah, um, you started seeing this like a lot. Dirty Dancing did that. Um, Mannequin had had Starship. Nothing's gonna stop. Yeah, us. nothing's gonna stop us now. <laughs> I forget. And uh, you and had then the Prince soundtrack for uh, Batman. You had Breakfast Club. You had um, uh, the uh, the song from there. The was it? Simple Don't Mind? you forget about me? Yeah. yeah, Simple Minds. Simple Minds song. You had. I it started really becoming a part of the the movie going experience. Was that they played this hit song, and it was in the movie. I heard the Ray Parker Jr. song before I saw the movie. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And I heard that song constantly before the movie, and then when I finally saw the movie, when I was seven i was like holy shit it, yeah i didn't say holy shit but i was like <laughs> you're a foul mouth kid <laughs> exactly i was like that's that song i've been hearing all the time i had no idea it was ghostbusters even though it says ghostbusters yeah you know i didn't know that there was a movie that went along with this what's and- funny is that i owned that single of axel f because I'd heard it on the radio, mm-hmm. but you know enough about my upbringing to know that I didn't see that movie until I went to college. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't see Beverly Hills Cop. I, I was aware of Eddie Murphy. This is also the decade Eddie Murphy tries to be a pop star for a little bit. Right. Yeah, man. He and Bruce Willis both released full albums. Yeah. Yep. Bruce Willis under the boardwalk. Never forget. <laughs> uh, Eddie Murphy. Party, party all, all the, the time. time. Party all the time. Which, he of course, did a... my brother and I sang as Potty all the time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Eddie Murphy did a song with Michael Jackson called What's Up With You? <laughs> Mm. And it is possibly, it, everybody Google this right now, after you're done with the podcast, Google this and watch the video. It's the most hilariously awkward video, and it's the worst song that you'll ever hear. As far as comedians are concerned, Eddie Murphy was probably on top of everybody there. I think you're yeah. right. With Raw, his yeah. stand-up stuff. Well, his stand-up stuff was delirious and raw, and you had uh, you had Trading Places, you had 48 Hours, you had Beverly Hills Cop. Coming uh, to America. Coming to America. None of these, I mean, the, it didn't really come to a stop until he did The Golden Child. Yeah. yeah. The Golden Child was his first, like, PG-13 movie. And uh, and then he had, uh, it was basically, took him till the 90s to get the comeback and everything. But, because uh, that's what we came to see Eddie Murphy for, is that he said, you know, he could say whatever he wanted to, and he could get a PG-13 oh, Eddie man. Murphy. Oh, man. If I can come into America, man. Yeah. What a perfect encapsulation of, like, his peak abilities because he and Arsenio Hall both are, play almost every character in this, yes. uh, every side character. In oh, this. and the barbershop scene the barbershop is so fantastic. Rocky And he's playing the Jewish guy. Yeah. And, 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 totally unrecognizable. And you got Arsenio Hall doing like the, uh, the, the revival <laughs> preacher guy. Yeah. And, and, like, sexual chocolate yes yeah, sexual chocolate like, i believe the children are our future yeah <laughs> well, let them lead the way and, you. and you also have the first appearance of samuel l jackson in coming yeah America. he robs the uh comes in to try to rob the mcdougals mcdougals that's yeah right. uh, i don't know why but i just read that, that somewhere in la they opened a mcdougals oh really oh, really <laughs> and I, I i suppose that means they're gonna make a remake uh who knows or a sequel why would you why would you build a whole restaurant to promote a fake restaurant from a 30 year old movie mm. <laughs> they have the golden arches we have the golden arcs right? yeah 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 <laughs> uh um but uh yeah that movie's really good it was really i mean you, you could also argue as far as directors ivan reitman and john landis mm-hmm. even though it wasn't a really good decade for john landis because of the twilight zone stuff um, what, what Twilight Zone? Story? Do you not ever hear that story? I don't think I so. I think it just got panned really bad. Uh-huh. Right? You never heard of the Twilight Zone story? Uh-uh. That he killed two people, basically. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I was about okay, to say yeah, you yeah. definitely it was like an unsafe the... work environment, death kind of thing, right? He, um, there were child labor laws, and he circumvented the child labor laws to go and do this dangerous helicopter scene um past the hours of when like people who could actually help out with the safety and everything were ah. concerned and they tried to shoot this scene and it was jennifer jason lee's dad also in this scene and i can't remember his name it has nothing to do with lee or anything like that hmm. i can't remember his name though um and uh they went and did this scene and apparently a lot of people were telling him don't do this sh- shot there's this is too dangerous the helicopters are too low all this other stuff and then uh yeah, helicopter crashed and 
killed the kid and it killed the Jennifer Jason Lee's dad. Hmm. And uh, and then Spielberg, who was also part of that Twilight Zone movie, had to, you know, you know, he had he. I guess they, he and Landis were friends and they had, they had to sort of dissolve the friendship and all that because he heard all the stories about mm. uh, what he did to get that scene to, you know, to start filming and everything. That's that's crazy. Landis because... survives that and then goes on to make Coming to America yeah, yeah, and everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, but he had a great career. You have that one part in there, though, yeah. that you have to always consider with him. And he was essentially gone after coming to america it's almost like they let him have one movie because you know? hmm. he, he 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 did other movies after that but none of them with the impact ivan reitman's the same way though ivan reitman had a great 80s and then the 90s it kind of after dave yeah it's kind of kind of went downhill after that it's crazy how interwoven all those guys are because in in blues brothers spielberg makes a cameo in there mm -hmm. and that was landis yep, right that was landis and then you've got all these ivan reitman's and harold ramus and all these guys kind of in in spielberg and then lucas like yeah everybody's kind of six degrees of each other yeah, in yeah. The that's 80s. why you have carrie fisher and blue Ru blues brothers yeah, yeah. you have yeah it's just like a, a and then you start then you throw in the jim henson stuff yeah and like jim henson starts using a lot of these you know these these uh these actors and everything that's another thing about the 80s right the puppets uh, pu the muppets and the puppets yeah <laughs> you have you have muppets and puppets but the thing is is that the characters that we saw in the 80s were almost always animatronic yeah or or puppets or whatever mm -hmm. and and there i don't i debate uh constantly what's realer quote unquote because those puppets can look fake yeah uh, but yeah there was always something about being able to actually feel like you can touch those characters that always made me like this better than cgi stuff although cgi can be good when they really dedicate you know it looks real a lot of the time but but there's something about those puppets, man. There's something endearing about it. Maybe he had to be a kid back in the. I don't early know. I 80s. mean, try try to think about how they would do Gremlins now. Yeah, yeah. And it would be, I think, probably weird. Yeah, it would probably be CG, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah, that would be weird. Yeah, it would be. It would be just like the whatever the fuck in uh, Justice League, the whatever the flying the parademons, the parademons, parademons yeah. thing. You, there, I feel like they would lose some character. Yeah. Uh, in uh, somehow, some way, they're going to lose some character. Although I don't know. Occasionally, they can do this right. You know, so it's. It, it, I could be short selling it, but there's something about being able to actually see them, like actual physical material. You can tell the difference. Yeah, most of the time. Look at the prequels, Yoda versus the Empire Strikes Back, Yoda. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that that eighties stuff was a big fantasy decade. It's it started, you know, Star Wars influence was was just tremendous mm -hmm. as far as science fiction and fantasy. Uh, you had Labyrinth, you had uh, you had Legend, you had uh, you Willow, had Willow. You had all these movies, and uh, and then the Dark Crystal, and yeah. uh, and then yeah, uh, several Muppets movies. Yep. But uh, even though I wouldn't consider those fantasy or anything, but uh, anyway, those fantasy movies too. There's some, there's something about never ending story. Never ending story, yeah. There's, there's something about it, man. As that does, that is my childhood. So that's probably a, a bias or whatever. But uh, uh, those movies seem to be more than just their effects or um, puppets. No, or they're whatever. singular. Look at Labyrinth. Mm hmm. I watched Labyrinth a lot growing up. There's some a, a movie that's 80s as fuck. That is 80s as fuck, oh, which boy. is which is so crazy that you know half of it takes place in a in a fantasy world. Right. But there's something about the the tactile nature of those Muppets. The mm -hmm. fact that you know when you uh, you have to force the uh, uh, the door knocker into this this puppet's mouth yeah. to make it work, and then the the guy with the uh, going through its nose and everything like that was very you know immediate it wasn't it wasn't there was no distance from it like what you see from you know cg yoda flapping around and you know <laughs> swapping <laughs> swatting at count dooku you know right swatting at him. swatting he's swatting at him i got a question did the 80s solidify or create the montage and we oh, talk man. we talk a lot about montages going back to the rocky movies i i think montages have always been there i mean we saw mon i think we saw montages in godfather Mm -hmm. uh but 
I think the the montage with the soundtrack yeah. Yeah. is probably where we got that uh, in the 80s. Because Rocky, obviously, was a big, big proponent of having some sort of hit song while he trained. Yes. Um, and, Scarface was one, too. Yeah, yeah. Push it to the limit. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's all like how that uh, that Trey Parker song goes. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, show every every time we show you, it's a little bit more improvement. <laughs> and uh, it's we you know we can't show it all to you because it's too long um so so yeah i mean good god man rocky four obviously was the king of the montage yeah. there's five montages in rocky four and it's an hour and a half movie yeah um uh and and like two of them i think are just like him remembering the other rockies <laughs> yeah. do we like rocky four yeah uh, sure yeah what is it about rocky four because it's an objectively bad movie yeah it right? is but it can't it hit in the middle of that cold war shit <laughs> yeah and it's a cold war movie and then the way they set this up ivan drago is this i don't know he's the perfect russian villain mm -hmm. not only is he younger and he's stronger and uh he's jackson storm yes he yeah is. <laughs> exactly <laughs> cars three he is that he not only is he younger and he's stronger but he's uh he can't just be younger and stronger. He's also taking steroids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. You know, well, like his... a putin -esque figure looks on approvingly. Exactly. Right? <laughs> that was Gorbachev. And, and he's, it was a fake Gorbachev. And, and it kills me, that movie. The movie is so ridiculous, and a lot of times I think that's what's so appealing about it. They show him, there's a montage in the movie where it shows Ivan Drago hitting this thing and showing all the PSI or whatever the fuck. Yeah. And it keeps get it gets to the point of like it, instant death. If he got yeah. hit with that punch. And uh, of course, Rocky can take it at this point. That's the thing that's crazy about Rocky in 1975, that movie he's, he is already probably too old. Yes. Uh, he's probably on his last fights like that. He'll ever have. Ten years later, yeah. he's taken these punches from Ivan Drago yeah. and being like, "Yeah, whatever. It's the, the American way." My grandmother yeah. hits harder than that. <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, without blocking, too. Rocky's boxing style <laughs> is the most infuriating fucking thing. He's got his hands like by his testicles. Well, here's the thing: he doesn't box. He just he wins by heart. Yeah. yeah, he wins by willpower, right? And so he doesn't need to block. In fact, he's fueled by all these death punches he gets thrown <laughs> to his fat. Actually, fuels him somehow. Yeah. I don't know. I, I love watching that movie. Yeah, it's... I don't know if it's two, three, or four, but there's one where literally it looks like there's two rib eyes hanging on his face mm -hmm. instead of his eyes, like they're totally swollen shut. Mm -hmm. But yet he's still like taking punches right into his face. Yeah, without even attempting I, to block. It's unbelievable um it might be rocky three because uh because uh club you ain't so bad yeah clubber lang yeah uh because don't i don't know i can't yeah they do kind of uh blend together after a while <laughs> um but uh but yeah rocky four the the yeah ivan drago he's nice he's taking steroids he's he's you know he's hitting this thing with the psi and everything he's got all the equipment in the world and like yeah still can't beat rocky that's right it's like uh you know this is the way it is man the american way wins <laughs> speaking of rocky we've talked about how as a comedian it was probably eddie murphy's decade but this is the birth of the action star right where mm -hmm. bruce willis and schwarzenegger and stallone are all sort of credited with being like the first three action movie star superstar you can go back to the 70s and it's hard to find one person that was an action superstar right. that could command 10 20 million a picture but all three of these guys had huge decades yeah schwarzenegger and, uh, was almost a miracle in it's in himself because the movies he made before the terminator uh there's no hint of him i guess conan was like his real breakout i yeah. guess but, you know, you look at the early ones where he can't even speak English and they've dubbed him in right. and all that. Was that in Conan the Barbarian? Uh, no, it was in uh, something called uh, something New York. I can't remember what it was like. Uh, I can't remember that movie. Huh. But it, but it's it's definitely not Schwarzenegger. Yeah. They're like sitting there and they're like, he's in, they're looking at a poster or something. And he's like, it doesn't even look like me. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Schwarzenegger. Yes. Classic Schwarzenegger. But like... Um, yeah, uh, Conan the Barbarian was really his, I guess, breakout, and then the Terminator came yeah. and really made him a megastar. 
and everything. And so much so that he couldn't even be the bad guy again. You know, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Had, they make him the good guy in T2. And, and then it wasn't until like Mr. Freeze, uh, <laughs> like in Batman and Robin, they made him bad again. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, but yeah, the, uh, he was also in a bunch of buddy cop stuff too. He was in uh, red heat, oh, which yeah. is another red, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, another, uh, cold war thing. But, uh, you had red heat and you had, uh, predator, Total Recall. Total Recall. Total Recall was uh, ninety. I believe that was right at ninety. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fuck. But it, <laughs> but it feels like an eighties movie. Yeah, for I sure. mean, it, in nineteen ninety, we're still in the eighties, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, man, huge. Just became huge off of that Terminator movie. Yeah. You know what's weird is that you mentioned that ninety is essentially eighty, similar to what we were saying last time. It was like eighty is essentially the the late seventies. But there's a couple of movies in 89 that seem a lot more 90s to me, like Do the Right Thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, That seems much more forward thinking than your typical 80s movie. Yeah, that is for sure. Um, Uh, It's it's you always have. I think you have this with every decade, like for the most part, what's uh for the most part what you see uh you know in the late part of a decade is you start seeing the seeds of what you're going to start seeing in the next decade is the 70s had star wars and it had jaws that's what the seeds of the 80s were uh in the 80s you had stuff like do the right thing and 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 stuff that i can't think of right now off the top of my head that really informed what the 90s would be too but Mm -hmm. that's really a good one that's a good example of what the 90s you know I mean, even Last Crusade, uh, we were saying that, you know, it, it's it's more timeless. But that, to me, seems more like a, just looks like more of a 90s movie to me than it does even Raiders of the Lost Ark, obviously, and, and Temple of Doom, which had more of an 80s aesthetic to it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you could see you could see even something like Who Framed Roger Rabbit in the, the late 80s, where it was like, we're going to start pushing technology and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a movie also that i i can't decide if i still like Man, i don't i don't i used to love who framed roger Rabbit, yeah. and when we watched it the senate now this doesn't usually happen usually when i watch <laughs> something that i like and we sent it it's like i still love it mm-hmm. this one i couldn't oh my god it just bothered me so much how much you know uh I don't know what what it was, but no. it, 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 I realized I didn't like it anymore. <laughs> and, um, what else is there? I feel like it was a really strong decade, maybe the only first strong decade for baseball movies. Because mm. you got Field yeah. of Dreams. Pretty sure Eight Men Out was made in the 80s. It was. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bull Durham, Major, Major League. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, and you will get the Sandlot later in the 90s. And, of course, you know, who could forget Mr. 3000? <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's, I don't feel like the 70s have any kind of collection of baseball movies or even good sports movies. We get the Hoosiers in the 80s. Um, in, the, in the 70s. And the Natural. Yeah, the Natural, too. Yeah, the Hoosiers was in the 80s. But uh, the 70s, you had stuff like Slapshot, which is another grimy. Yeah. It's a comedy, but it's yeah. grimy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think the longest yard came out in the seventies yeah. and uh, you had, those were also, the, I mean, even the sports comedies were grimy yeah. back in the seventies. <laughs> yeah. uh, but in the eighties, it was more about the uh, underdog winning the big thing yeah. at the end. That was the whole, that was the whole thing about the eighties comedies. Major league was the Cleveland Indians, you know, perpetually bad but of course gets get they get one player and yeah. they're amazing <laughs> awesome um and uh bull durham was and now bull durham is a really good movie like yeah. it's uh it's it doesn't have much to do actually with this the team itself or anything it's more about the life around baseball and uh and uh so yeah there's none of that hokey kind of like you know and even when he gets that record-breaking home run at the end or whatever it's done with very little fanfare um but yeah most for the most part though yeah they were all that's where you started getting those underdog sports comedies uh but yeah you're right the baseball baseball was big for some reason in the 80s and it could be that effect that i talk about the reason why i love baseball like everything was dramatic in the 80s playoffs and everything yeah uh, the 80 the 85 and the 86 mm-hmm. playoffs were amazing well, and the NFL wasn't half what it is today no. in terms of popularity. And then the NFL had a strike in the in '87. Yeah. 
So, um, so yeah, there was the. Uh, I guess, that's when Keanu Reeves came to play. Was coached right. by Gene Hackman. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the uh, it's almost like uh, again to continue that theme of the decade and everything. Baseball was considered America's pastime. Yeah. So everything is is it was sort of uh, comforting to go yeah. to baseball on on these movies and everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think you're right. What else, Barrett? Oliver Stone. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, and it would continue into the 90s for sure with JFK, but this is really where he made an imprint. Uh, I, I think he was active, obviously, with, with writing in the 70s, but the trio of Platoon and um, Wall Street, mm-hmm. and then, of course, he wrote he wrote Scarface, right? Yeah, he wrote Scarface. Um, he really had a, a, like a weird a weird footprint yeah on, on this decade he now of all now he was the anti the decade because mm-hmm. his movies were more about here's what we should be focusing on right. while we're sitting there dancing to simple minds yeah you know? <laughs> um the uh the you know platoon even though it was a vietnam war movie and everything is is you know it's we really need to look at the atrocities of Vietnam more clearly than what even the seventies said. Yeah. The seventies, it was just, Oh, it's all crazy. Yeah. In the eighties, they started talking about like, here's some real stuff that we fucking did. That's really bad. And that we need to look back, look back at it because you see that in platoon, you see it in casualties of war, Mm -hmm. uh, where it's like, you know, we weren't angels in Vietnam. And uh, and then Wall Street was uh, sort of an answer to the the Keating Five and all that that was going on. Uh, the you have a, 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 of course a, just a tremendous amount of scandal going on in Wall Street and like all that. I mean, it's probably still going on today, right yeah, now exactly. as we're talking. There's somebody fucking somebody <laughs> like with oh, their yeah. decisions. Oh um, yeah, but he was a. I mean, it, what what's lost in all of his conspiracy stuff that he gets into later on he's a really talented filmmaker Mm -hmm. like wall street has a great look to it uh he's got great shots he's got those wonderful tracking shots of charlie sheen coming out you know Mm -hmm. crying and all that stuff that big wide shot of him and michael douglas in central park you know at the end and platoon man has of course it's got the iconic shot of the the soldier at the end with the the raised Mm -hmm. fist and everything getting shot you know i mean he's he's really got a nice aesthetic uh, to him that I think has been kind of overshadowed when well, he's done and World Trade Center and W and shit like that. With Stone, when he gets into the '90s, is that after he does JFK, which is a tour of force as far as directing is concerned, mm-hmm. uh, he he basically takes that editing style where he's got the different film stocks and all that yeah. and puts it into Natural Born Killers. And Natural Born Killers is the most divisive movie I've ever run into yeah. in my entire life. I love Natural Born Killers, mm-hmm. but I can totally see if you hate that movie. Me too. And um, and so, like, Natural Born Killers is all over the place. And you either are with it or you're not. But he took that and just did that with everything. It even does it in U-Turn later. Mm-hmm. Any Given Sunday. Any Given Sunday. He's got this thing where it's like, I'm going to do this in every movie now. My name is Willie Beeman. <laughs> <laughs> the lady's cream. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was the shades of the future pop career for Jamie Foxx. That's right. Yes, it was. Um, but yeah, uh, I, that's, a, that's a good call on Oliver Stone because uh, he definitely was had a period there. Where, and, the, and, and there's another movie that you guys may have not seen called Salvador which is another mm. one that James Woods, right? James Woods, yeah. where he's a photographer. I can't remember where he goes and shoots his stuff or whatever, but that's a really good movie too. And of course, born on the 4th of July, which right. I'm not sure we, did we say that? I'm not Mm-mm. sure we did. Born on the 4th of July came right after wall street. It was platoon wall street and born on the 4th of July. That was the first time that people really took Tom Cruise seriously as a yeah. director, more than just a box office guy and everything. And he's really good in born on the 4th oh, yeah. of July um another vietnam movie where he's taking a look at us more than he's taking a look at vietnam and like how fucked up vietnam was and everything so it's an interesting it's weird also did tom cruise have a bigger 80s or 90s Ooh. oh man Ooh. tom cruise so, i mean not bigger i'm sure he made more money so, in the 90s so cruise really st- it has he still he starts building up that career from taps and mm-hmm. then uh, goes on he's in he's 
for whatever reason, out of all the people in the Outsiders, he's got the smallest role. Right. Yeah. And then he's then uh, he's got Risky Business, which I'm not sure was a big hit. Mm. I think it got uh, appreciated later. Um, but then Top Gun is the one that really takes him, and that's '86. Right. So we're at '86 at this point, and now he's making like uh, he makes uh, Rain Man, Days of Thunder, Days of Thunder. A uh, cocktail, which a lot of people still love. I fucking love cocktail. <laughs> uh, oh, it's great. Uh, he he be- Bermuda. He really does. Jamaica. He really does. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he really does become huge in the eighties. I think his nineties is probably where he is because in the nineties he has this streak of movies that make a hundred million or more. Like oh, that's five right. Five or yeah, six yeah, in yeah. a row. Because uh, uh, it was the, the firm, and you had uh, Jerry Maguire, Mission Impossible, um, and. Uh, Interview with the vampire. Interview with the vampire <laughs> yeah, made yeah, over a yeah. hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to look back at that and think that, but yeah, it sure did. Sure, God, I saw did. that movie on like a couple months ago. What a fucking drag! Yeah, it that is movie awful, is terrible, and mm-hmm. it's boring, and it's pouty, and it's dark, and I'm just like, no one, no one in the six months you were filming this tapped the director and said this movie's gonna be shit. Yeah. this is gonna be terrible. <laughs> There's not a movie here. I know. <laughs> Keep yeah uh so yeah i mean cruise you, i mean if you hadn't said harrison ford cruise definitely had like a chance there to say we could say he he's the guy who owns the decade but it takes him until 86 yeah. to start really getting huge and then it's the 90s where he is international box office star tom cruise yeah um and uh it's it continues to today by the way almost everything he comes out with it may fail here but it does bonkers <laughs> the around. mummy yeah the mummy <laughs> did yeah. that make them did that make enough i mean they're not going to keep, keep going though no, no matter how but much it, it made overseas no but it may i think it, it made enough to get them to break even oh, okay that movie. well who knows these days i just read that george miller is suing the studio over mad max fury road no really because somehow through their accounting that movie has yet to make a profit hmm what it's uh, sounds made up uh, <laughs> uh the mummy has made 409 million dollars god worldwide. damn it. And you the budget was what 185 something uh, like that budget was five bucks went to the cg yeah 125 125 so yeah, yeah they definitely broke even on that movie and, and maybe even made a profit on made it. 80 million domestic 329 internationally <laughs> Yeah, so so the the whole Scientology thing, which is where Cruz went wrong, it, it, way way back in two thousand six when that started to fester, because it hurt Mission Impossible three totally. Even though I don't, I'm not a big huge fan of that. Valkyrie movie. tanked too. Nobody went to see Valkyrie. In in Valkyrie's good. Too. I know. I like Valkyrie's it. really good. Um, but uh, but yeah, like uh, two thousand six, the the Scientology and the jumping on the couch and all. Well, he didn't really jump on the couch, but that was. <laughs> That's something that YouTube did, but um, no, he did. No, he didn't jump on it. He didn't jump up and down on it. He jumped onto he it. He jumped not... onto it. That's all I meant. Okay. He jumped on. Yeah, it. he jumped onto That's it. But still they, pretty stupid. But they made it. They made it out to be where he just was jumping up and down <laughs> on the couch. It's like I mean I know there's always been rumors about Tom Cruise, but that jumping on the couch to prove how much I'm in love with Katie Holmes is like what an alien would do. Like, yeah, I don't know how to human. I think this is how I show excited. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really, really weird. Oh, no, it was very strange. He's and then there was Night and Day. Things. Was that in the 90s? No, no Night and was... Day came out in 2000. So is it during the same Scientology era where he, his movies were faltering? Yeah, Night and Day was after that, after all that, you know, the the perceived, the you know, whatever, cru- Cruise being crazy and everything came out after uh, Night and Day came out. You want to know what's that. nuts? The same guy that made Night and Day made Logan. Yep. Think oh, about, that's think right. about well, that. If you look at James Mangold's career, <laughs> he's all over the place. It's all over the place. Yeah. Like he's got some really good ones, and then he's got what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I think he made that Room Twenty Three or whatever Identity. I think he made Identity. Oh, that's a, that's yeah. Good. I think he did, and he made a movie called Heavy in the nineties. That was, was really good. Uh, he made uh, Walk the Line, Copland, uh, Copland. Yeah, mm. he made a lot of really good movies. But yeah, he's got he's got also uh, Wolverine on his resume. I kind of enjoy Night and Day. Oh yeah, I've got I've I've heard people say that. I mean, yeah, that's all I have to say. It's inoffensive. It's far less offensive than the scene with him and Cameron Diaz in Vanilla Sky. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. 
I swallowed your cum. There you go. I'm glad I didn't have to say it. <laughs> right. You should have. You, you should have heard what? some of the things I almost referred to the mother box as when we were talking about <laughs> yeah. Justice League. It's at that point that I would have not wrecked the car. I would have been like, you know what? You got a point there. <laughs> <laughs> She does make a point. <laughs> I forgot all about that. Oh, my God. Oh, um, shit. So, anyway. 80s. The 80s. Yeah. <laughs> and we sort of touched on it in the 70s with the horror movies. 80s horror movies are the ultimate in this just weird decade, man. Yeah. This decade that you're talking about excess. 80s horror movies are the top of excess. Oh, yeah. Um, all the movies that even started in the seventies became ridiculous. Like, I don't know. They became, uh, tangents of themselves. Yeah. They didn't even seem like the same franchise anymore. Halloween, Halloween has its fans as far as when it gets into like four and five right. and stuff like that. I've watched them. I don't like them, but is that season of the witch is one of those? Well, season of the witch was the one where they did it without Michael Myers. Right. And, and it's, they were trying to make a new Halloween every year. So they were hoping season of the witch would be, you know, Oh, we can do different Halloween stories without Michael Myers. And no, no, yeah. you, can't. <laughs> you really can't. You can't, you, you can't, and make that movie anyway right, right um but yeah friday the 13th was this very simple thing with you know people getting killed at the lake and everything it's now it's you know it's constant death and boobs and <laughs> and everything uh you know you have hellraiser you have uh, nightmare on elm street nightmare on elm street that everything is a little bit more in your face silent night deadly night silent night deadly night <laughs> that's right prom night yeah uh, yeah, uh, yeah you have the yeah, the it, this is the decade of the vhs boxes to me oh yeah like oh, yeah. every time you went into blockbuster like there was a, something about those movies they all had that same aesthetic on their on their their video box or yeah. whatever uh just their mother box yeah their mother box <laughs> um but uh uh, god and there were so many of them it seemed like every year there was a new one and like uh, freddy krueger was i mean i was seven or eight years old i had kid like people my age who loved freddy krueger yeah, like, yeah. how the fuck are you getting to watch these movies yeah, seriously. <laughs> you know, i don't get it man. i would catch nightmare on elm street on cable like if i was staying with my grandparents or something like that mm. meanwhile i was watching like a tape from tv version of jesus of nazareth Ooh that's that sounds delightful <laughs> yes it gets a bit predictable when you see it over and over. i can imagine <laughs> you know that how it ends um yeah nightmare on elm street like just didn't scare me even back in those mm -hmm. days because it was so over the top and so campy and everything that it, there was no real investment into they're it they're essentially Maybe it came comedies late. they're essentially comedies. they are and i guess if you watch it as such i mean there's some our friend jonathan loves him some dream warriors the, yeah. the nightmare on elm street three and uh, apparently that's a a pretty good movie, but uh, I'll never know because I'll never watch the motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that was definitely a skip decade. For oh horror. my god, it, that's the the whole thing. It was eighties were a decade of decadence, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it was about people getting rich, man. You can get rich. Everybody's getting rich, and like it's like, and then you had these producers who were very rich they were they were the embodiment of these people in wall street and everything yeah. uh who were funding a lot of these movies it was I think it's uh, uh mario Casar and andrew vanya who did the rambo movies mm. they were the producers of those movies and it's like rambo is the embodiment of american ideals <laughs> america is kicking your ass that's what these rambo movies are about and it goes completely away from that first rambo yeah and uh and uh completely completely it's like a, not even gotta, the same franchise you just gotta butter sly up and <laughs> give him a couple of machine guns have shells falling all over himself and that's it yeah and uh they also were producers on the terminator movies too like a lot of those big like just really ridiculous action movies you can see their names on there um so like everything's just sort of in your face man just a lot of like I don't know. These movies are bigger and they're like, they're trying to, it's almost like maybe 
maybe it wasn't just the fact that the political landscape was changing, but the way they figured marketing was concerned was changing. They finally found out that it was eight ma- white males, 18 to maybe 34, mm-hmm. maybe whatever. That's who was going to the movies. Let's make movies for them. They're the people who are buying our tickets. So everything back then was doing that. That's why Revenge of the Nerds is so filthy, because they didn't actually expect any women would ever see that film. Yeah. (laughs) It only takes one woman to see that film to know, this should not have been made. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Especially when the the main guy puts on the mask of the boyfriend of the girl that he, like, goes and has sex with. Yep. And, like, after he pulls the mask off, she's like, well, since you did a good job. <laughs> oh, my God. God almighty. Everything's okay. <laughs> there were no women anywhere near that set. Oh, my God. <laughs> Except for the ones that were on camera. Yes. The yes. ones who were getting spied on by the video yeah, camera. And that's, that's in perpetuity, by the way. Like, there's never any point where they show them taking the cameras out <laughs> right. or anything. It's there That's, forever. like, constantly there. Like, if you're, like, you, you take your classes, you go back to the, the house and hey, uh, women are changing and showering on the TV. You don't ever change it to anything else. Um, it's oh my god, that, and yeah, it's why that's that don't give a fuckism we've talked about mm-hmm. about the eighties, man. They didn't give a fuck about anything. Um, that's what I think the you know the the Stranger Things and everything that's uh, the the aesthetic that they've reproduced and everything. You look back at those old horror movies. Look at the that look at the uh, intro, the music. Yeah. The music, the way the title comes in and everything, that's what every 80s movie is to me, I think. Um, There are, okay, so there are some movies that came out in this decade that I feel like they were different kind of Oscar type of movies. There was a lot of epics that came out in the 80s. Um, Gandhi, Mm -hmm. uh, Out of Africa, The Last Emperor, uh movies were stuffier uh, when they were going for oscars <laughs> yeah. um it, the 70s had this you know this griminess to them and everything and and the best picture winners from those from those years you know are i don't know there's 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 not really very many like what what's the the fake title of the movie that you came up with the uh, uh piece of fruit in a cup <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um there the it seems like a lot of these movies are a piece of fruit in the cup <laughs> 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 um the 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 movies that are winning best picture in the 80s or i mean it, there's like amadeus is is a, a standout out yeah. of this group yeah you had um was it ordinary people ordinary people which was it's a ba- i mean it's a basic type of movie um uh was it 82 was gandhi mm. 83 was terms of endearment which oh, is yeah. a good movie mm-hmm. but it's it's also very melodramatic and all that um 84 was amadeus 85 was out of africa mm. 86 was the last emperor no it was platoon mm. 87 was the last emperor 88 was rain man and then 89 was driving miss daisy <laughs> Uh, and it's one of the it's one of the most it's one of the blandest best picture decades that you can come up with platoon's good amadeus is good rain man is okay i guess i like rain man i like gandhi it's just so fucking long. gandhi's so long out of africa is not a good movie right. i'm sorry i don't like it uh terms of endearment's okay i mean it's, but they're not like just movies you sink your teeth in nope uh but um yeah, though the it seemed like a lot of these movies were trying to be these three hour epic yeah. go for the Oscar type things. You didn't really see that in the seventies, really. There's not very many movies that are going to three hours almost. Right. To, you know, these big huge epics or whatever. They're usually a good two hours, two hours, ten minutes, and they, they do they you know, they do their business and they they move on. <laughs> do their business. That's right. Whereas, they get their business done. Whereas in the eighties it was like, let's let's see how long we can make these I movies. I feel like the eighties is the decade where uh, sci-fi got fun oh, okay because you know we had an alien in the 70s we had 2001 not fun neither one of those are fun um but there's not a lot i don't think in the 60s and 70s unless you're going to count like that disney shit like the cat from outer space and all that <laughs> which the i'm black not. hole the black hole um 
but you know, it starts with Wrath of Khan and a good run of Star Trek films. Because mm-hmm. uh, Search for Spock is a fun adventure, and then the fourth one is just flat out comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also had shit like The Last Starfighter, yeah, and Starman, um, and I remember a sense of wonder as a kid at, from these space movies because I hadn't seen anything like 2001 or Alien at this point in my life. Yeah, yeah. The first space movies that I'm seeing were shit like this, The Explorers. Yeah, I was about to say, Explorers. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, space Camp. Uh, it's the first time I think movies decided to make space seem fun, to the point where in the 90s, when shit like Event Horizon comes out, I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. Space is fun. I want to have an adventure. What are you, this is killing me. By the way, The Last Starfighter is a movie that I know I've seen probably more than 10 times, and I can't remember anything about it. <laughs> well, it, it's the one where he plays the video no, game No, I so understand well. what the story is. I just don't remember much anything. No, else. I don't remember much about it either. I, like, I know that he can play that game well, and the aliens come down and get him because he's so good at it, and that's how he wins. <laughs> he goes up into space because he can play the game well. <laughs> Uh, Do you think adults back when that movie came out were like scoffing at it like I am now? Was it just the premise? But the only reason probably. we accepted it was because we're kids. It yeah. makes no sense at all. Yeah. You're <laughs> so good at this video game. We need you to come up to space. There were a lot of like, yeah, there, we had a lot of these uh, kids central. I don't know. Uh, Cloak and Dagger was one of those. The Another one where a video game features prominently. Um, it's like kids were a were a decent part of a lot of these big movies. Yeah. Labyrinth, even Jennifer Connelly is like fourteen in that movie. Yeah, um, and the Spielberg stuff. Yeah, too. and the Spielberg stuff where you have uh, E. T. Mm-hmm. and and all that. Uh, it, it's they 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 were able to handle kids pretty well, I think. Even though the entertainment geared towards kids. Mm was fucked up sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> was a lot fucked up but uh but yeah the sci-fi stuff was really good back then like that's i, I just I, I don't know there was something uh, exciting about it i don't know what it was it may have been just the it may have been just the the fact that it, it was a it was one person i don't know like it was this luke skywalker type of uh, uh prototype or whatever like have a theory. you could do this mm-hmm. yeah i have a theory um because we didn't get to live through putting a man on the moon and the apollo missions and all that but this the 80s is when the space shuttles were going up yeah with crews of seven it was a new vehicle we were going to reuse them and every launch was a big deal i've talked before about the challenger disaster they called us all into the gym to watch the launch of the space shuttle so i think there was more space optimism and hope in Mm -hmm. general um and of course we we were just right at the right age for that yeah right so i don't know i watched every i watched every space shuttle launch that happened in the 80s every Mm -hmm. single one of them it's It's crazy it it, it was it's it had to have been regional because i i i remember because first off the challenger thing was on my birthday i remember that Mm. the the other thing is that i was we were all out at recess when that was going on oh wow so when we came back, that's when they they actually let us watch the news coverage of it afterwards. So it had happened and everything. That's so, interesting. They showed us the launch, and when that thing blew up, they turned the TV off and sent us all back to class in a hurry. Really? Yeah. I didn't. I mean, for whatever reason, I mean, the damage is done. I just saw it explode. Right. I'm maybe nine years old, but I'm not stupid. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which reminds me of Dakota Fanning's guest appearance on Friends, where she says to Joey, "I'm eight. I'm not an idiot." Anyway, um, <laughs> it's not like you know i mean granted you don't want to just show it over and over and over again but it was almost like they could undo us having seen it if they turned the tv off fast <laughs> nothing to see here yeah yeah that didn't happen go back to class <laughs> do math but you had goonies yep. you know goonies was another one where mm. children were empowered to do what you know to get on these adventures and everything i don't know they did, don't really i guess those type of adventures still happen in movies you still see them Oh, you're seeing it in Stranger Things. Yeah, you see it in Stranger Things. Featuring but, I mean, Stranger as far enough, as, Sean Astor. Right, but if you see, like, uh, you know, movies that come out with kids as the adventurers, I don't know, maybe, I mean, maybe a little bit of Harry Potter, mm-hmm. it, it was still, you can still see that. Uh, um, and It, I mean, any yeah. of the Stephen King I things. I saw the new yeah. Tomb Raider trailer, she looks like a kid. <laughs> oh really <laughs> is that alicia of it is yeah, yeah, yeah it is she i, I like her but she's she has 12 year old face <laughs> <laughs> well i like how you summed up the decade as decadence mm-hmm. uh because 
you know, when when we talked about the seventies, like immediately we all thought about like gritty and grime and stuff like that. And I was struggling to figure out like what term would define the eighties. And I think overall, yeah, decadence is is kind of everything that's behind it, that that's shown on screen and all that stuff. So yeah, I like that. Yeah, there was a there was sort of an attitude about the eighties. The people who were in charge were these rich white guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were they they're I keep thinking about I'm not going to say what's was said because I don't want to like, you know, get and turn this podcast into something super dirty or anything. But I keep going back to that hit and run book that I read and the producers like the stuff that they say, man, it's just insane what (laughs) the way they think and everything. And uh, but but these guys, man, they just they gave zero fucks. Mm-hmm. It was it was it was all about the machine. They realized after Star Wars that you could make a lot of money if you directed your movie towards these, you know, these 18 to 28 year old whatever white guys yeah. and, you know, made these dumb action movies and all these movies with titties in them and all this. other, You know, it's yeah. just that that I mean, it it takes a while to kind of like find the gold in the eighties. Yeah. Ghostbusters back to the future. You know, it takes a while to find those like just truly good gems because what defines that decade so much to me is that kind of movie, the Rambos, the Porkies, yeah. the, you know, that type of stuff, even though, like I said, you got John Hughes in there. He's not doing that kind of crazy stuff. You know, you have, yeah, you have Back to the Future, you have Goonies, you have you know, you have a lot in there. It's yeah. just that it I don't know if it defines the decade. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy, right? Yeah. Those exactly. movies are awesome. I don't know if they define the decade. I think they, they rise to the top over time, but mm. during the eighties you probably had to sift through a lot of bullshit. I mean, yeah, Back to the Future is a very eighties movie. I don't think it it's not very many things in there that you have to really know the eighties to get though. Mm-hmm. Like there are a couple of things where he's like asking for the tab and the Pepsi right. free and all that. <laughs> but, uh, but for the most part, I think if you're, even if you were born past the, you know, like the nineties or whatever, that's some movie you can really enjoy mm-hmm. and everything. And I'm not sure if it really defines what that decade is, but yeah, decadence. I think it's just the, just the fact that there was a bunch of rich guys just like, yep. Let's just pound these pound these viewers with like violence and sex and you know it's just over the top. The '90s starts to curtail that a bit, and it it's a lot due to the AIDS epidemic and all mm-hmm. that too. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, you know, we start getting a little bit more responsible type of stuff. I always like to close our podcast main discussions by talking about AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, it's a tease for the next episode. It's really, it's really, honestly, <laughs> you know, to make people aware of it. All, All right, right. ready for some questions? Let's do some questions. I want the truth. Question. Question. I got something to say. I want the truth. I am listening. Oh, we got some good ones. We got some really good ones. Keep these things coming, man. I love them. What is your favorite? And this is favorite with a U, uh, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, indicative of some sort of European influence, which is always welcome. uh, It's always stupid to spell a word with more letters than you need. (laughs) Right? Start trimming it down, Britain. (laughs) Right? Come on. Take your U's out of shit. What is your favorite song from a movie that the actor sings? Uh, This person's is Pure Imagination in Willy Wonka. Great Mm, pick. Yeah, I like that. Um, I'm going to go with Wishing You Were Somehow Here Again by Emmy Rossum in The Phantom of the Opera. Oh, That was so, so in my running. Oh, man. So good. And what is what is the song title again? Wishing You Were Wishing You Were Somehow Here Again. I gotta remember what. Wishing that you like. were somehow here again. Oh, got you. Yeah, that yeah. one and uh, that's a great. I mean, there's a lot of great songs in Family Opera, but that's. I feel like that's her true showpiece. There's another one in there that's really good too. That mm-hmm. also could have been in the running as well, but that song is really pretty and really well done, and nice. it's amazing how much of a voice she has. At she's 17. got a great voice in that movie. Yeah. So. And she's just wasting her non her singing talent on Shameless. By the way, yeah, that's a good qu- that's a good thing that you just said there. Why hasn't someone taken Emmy Rossum and turned her into a movie star? Yet? I don't know. I have no idea. She has everything that you would want from a movie star, and somehow they fucked her up because they keep putting her in stuff like beautiful creatures and yeah. all this other just you know day after tomorrow yeah. and uh, 
she can do better than this. Yeah. Give her a script. Make her a star. God yeah. damn it. God yeah. damn it. <laughs> Speaking of musicals, I saw in front of my Justice League the trailer for this T.T. Barnum thing yep. with Hugh Jackman. Uh, this looks like the most misguided production I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. It looks weird, doesn't it? Everything about it, it's like it's trying to be a little Moulin Rouge, uh-huh. trying to be a little Les Mis. The fact that it's a musical boggles my goddamn mind because I think there's actually a really fascinating biopic about P.T. Barnum um, somewhere in there yeah. if, if you want to tell that story. But that's not going to be this. This is just going to be top hats and well, hell, half the trailer is literally them spinning around over and over inside. <laughs> that's the, exactly the big what top. I said yeah. to Chris mm-hmm. as we were watching. It, How many like, different dance <laughs> numbers are them spinning around yes. inside the big top? People twirling. Jesus. Yeah. Anyway, and it looks like water for elephants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's basically a combination of those three movies. It's just come on already. Yeah. We know you know that's not going to be a hit when you make it. How do you? Why? <laughs> why do you even make it? Why I think you? Hugh Jackman just had enough clout and wanted to sing again. Yeah, maybe so. You get um, everybody on the set, and you're like, nope. <laughs> Everybody disband. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go with an odd pick. Um, I'm going to go with Matt Damon singing "My Funny Valentine." Oh, that's a good one. In talented He's Mr. Really Ripley. Really good in that. And I love. If you pay attention early on in the movie, before when he's been hired by the father to go find the son in Europe, but before he's left, and he's trying to learn jazz because he knows Jude Law is super into jazz, and he doesn't. He does like he's trying to guess while it's blindfolded. And at one point he's like ironing a shirt or hanging a shirt and my funny Valentine is playing. And Matt Damon just goes, I can't even tell if this is a man or a woman. (laughs) (laughs) But then later on, once he's made it to Europe and he's getting into jazz and playing, singing on stage with Jude Law, there's this one moment where he does piano bass, my funny Valentine and Jude Law saxophone fills in between the lines. And he's got a really good voice for that song. And it even ends. It ends on a really high falsetto. Not ends, but it does that. Stay funny, Valentine. Stay. It goes up mm-hmm. high, and he nails it, man. Huh. Uh, but it's really subdued, and it, it's an emotional performance. Um, and every time I watch that movie, that scene stops me cold. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, wow, I never even knew he could sing at all. Except for, you know, Johnny Doesn't Know, or whatever that song is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Doesn't know. Uh, yeah. yeah. From uh, Road Trip, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, Euro Trip. Euro Trip. <laughs> yeah, it's Euro Trip. That's so it's old tell, Scotty. They were making Ocean's 12, and he's <laughs> right, like, right next door, and so he went over and did that cameo. It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so that was my answer. Good what about call. you? I really wanted to put Ali Cravalho in here. Uh, who's the voice of Moana and Moana? Ooh, because talk about a fucking powerful voice, man! Man, like that. How far I'll go? Song it's so good is it? It'll it gets the chill bumps going like as soon as she launches into this thing. Oh yeah, and then when she ah, oh, it's good stuff. <laughs> and and that theme kind of carries out throughout. And and she was only she was only sixteen. <laughs> she was only sixteen. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, so it's a really powerful performance. So, but my real pick. Is from a movie I don't like and that we've talked about before, Moulin Rouge. Mm-hmm. Um, Dick. The, the time that I saw that movie, I remember thinking, man, I don't like this. And then the second thought was, Ewan McGregor fucking goes for it. Mm-hmm. In this he does, movie. boy. Yeah. And like, he, he's got this nice, he was obviously coached up really well. He's got this wonderful, like, open tone to, to these high notes that he's hitting, especially with like your song when he's doing kind of the, uh, the medley in the middle of Roxanne, mm-hmm. uh, where he's bringing in his theme and everything. Yeah. Like he's just walking through and just like singing at the top of his lungs and he totally sells it. Mm-hmm. Nicole Kidman, not so much in this movie, but his voice is tailor made for the songs that they're they're doing in this movie, and I really really appreciated it. Even if the movie didn't work for me overall, I like come what may songs awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and he's perfect for it. Yeah, yeah. that's a good pick. And you wouldn't have thought that. I don't know if he's sung in any other movies since then. Uh, but... The one he did in drag, I think he did because that was oh, about a uh, singer. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I think, yeah, I think that's it. Is that what the movie? Was? I always get that confused with the two other drag movies that are famous: Tu Wong Fu and. Mm-hmm. No, it's star, 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 or something. Star Lord, Star Lord, <laughs> Queen of the Desert. Yeah, uh, too Wong Fu. He might sing in that one though. Yeah, but I mean, he, he was coming well, from Obi Wan. He did that spotting. song in. in uh... <laughs> he did. He did Duel of the Fates. <laughs> yeah, he's one of the oh! chorus. Oh! Oh! <laughs> uh, Velvet Goldmine. That's, That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. All right, I like that one. I really like this one. I had a question you might have fun answering. Uh, you've talked before about great ensemble casts in movies, but they're mostly A-listers. So what film do you think has the greatest B-list 
cast of all time? What a fun question. Yeah. I know. This person's example is John Carpenter's Ghosts of Mars from 2001, a film that's not quite as shitty as everybody remembers, but starring Natasha Henstridge, Jesus Ice Tatum. Cube, Jason Statham, and Pam Creer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a good one. Oh, it's terrible, but it, it has that great laugh when Ice Cube cuts himself trying to open the can. That's some good shit. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that movie's not worth watching just for one ice cube no. joke. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm going to go with Mulholland Falls. Yeah. Interesting. Now, there's one or two in here that are outliers and may not exactly fit the definition. Uh, and maybe one or two of them were A-list at one point in their career. But here's everybody who's in this movie. Nick Nolte, Melanie Griffith, Chaz Palminteri, who may be the king of B-movie mm. actors. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Michael Madsen. Wait, he's the king. Uh, Chris Penn. Treat Williams, Jennifer Connelly, okay, she's probably A-list at this point, Daniel Baldwin, Andrew McCarthy, John Malkovich is the only true great actor in this movie, Kyle Chandler, Titus Welliver, Bruce Dern, and William Peterson. Actually, I, you said Jennifer Connelly. I, I think Jennifer Connelly was not A-list until she did Beautiful Mind. I agree. She wasn't A-list when she made the movie. It, it's, it, it's crazy like like how long of a career she had and wasn't really a big name until that movie. Yep, yeah. Um, I that's have, a crazy list, by the way. Yeah, it yeah. Is. That's I just I actually. Do you want to know how I answered this question? Hmm. I googled Ma- Ma- Michael Madsen and Chris Penn, <laughs> <laughs> and I started looking at their filmographies until I found Mulholland Falls, and I was like, they're both in that. And then I started reading more and more and more. Tadius Welliver, Kyle Chandler, this is the king of B cast. Yeah. Um, I. Th- it's funny. The the first thing that came to mind was the Usual Suspects. Ooh, yeah. And you're talking about people who none of these people were a list when the movie came out. Nope. Now, obviously, unfortunately, now every Kevin Spacey movie has Kevin Spacey in it. Yeah, um, <laughs> you can't recast everything. Yeah, but Kevin Spacey at the time was not a list, so he was he was more of a kind of a B list character actor. You had Gabriel Byrne. Benicio del Toro, Kevin Pollock, Stephen Baldwin, Chaz Palminteri, yeah. <laughs> Giancarlo Esposito, yep. and you had Dan Hedaya and Peter Green, who was from Pulp Fiction, you know, uh-huh. the, uh, and the mask. With Zed. Um, so that was uh, that was a big uh, a big B list cast, I thought uh, for for that. And another one that I thought of that was more B movie, Surviving the Game. Oh, surviving oh, the game. Oh, yeah. Surviving the game has Ice T. You had Gary Busey, F. Murray <laughs> Abraham, John C. McGinley, Rutger Hauer, and Charles S. Dutton. Uh, wow, <laughs> so, that's pretty solid. Surviving the game is uh, is some some B movie mastery, man. Wow. It's a, it's it's a sort of a take on the most dangerous game. <laughs> uh but iced tea in there man yeah <laughs> that iced tea sells it yeah, pretty hard hell yeah oh uh, speaking of b movies and b casts now at the time this was supposed to be the the new shit the new hotness mm-hmm. we're, we're gonna be in 1991's mobsters yeah. oh. mobsters man i mean that was supposed to be untouchables for the next generation huge cast in this here we go christian slater Patrick Dempsey as oh, Jesus. the Jewish yeah. lawyer. You could pro- technically banker. stop right there, and it's a good answer. <laughs> Richard Grieco, yep. oh. Costas Mandalore, yep. F. Murray Abraham, yeah. oh, again. Dan Cortez. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I was about uh, to say. <laughs> F. Murray Abraham, Lara Flynn Boyle, Michael Gambon, and Anthony Quinn. Now, at some point, those two were Yeah, in. Anthony Quinn was huge, like, in the 60s. Yes, but otherwise, what a fucking crazy-ass yeah. cast, man. Yeah, that's good. And that movie... Watched it pretty recently. No, no. It's that that is that, never seen it. That is awful. And that was my jam. Like I was a twelve year old, and I was like, you know, love Christian Slater, loved mm-hmm. like slick. Are they playing type of things? Real gangsters yeah. or fictional ones? Yeah, I think they're playing real ones. Like um, Capone era. Guys. Capone era. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. And yeah. they were all dressed in like you know natty suits and stuff like that. And Christian Slater's got a scar to make him look legit and everything. Oh, this fucking movie, man! Yeah. Oh. Richard fucking Greco, man. I know. Yeah, Talk man. about that now. He, I don't even know if that's B list. Yeah, I'm about to say he might be all time C lister because yeah. that's where you see. What, you're talking about blockbuster video type yeah. stuff. He was always on those cheap ass covers. <laughs> Richard Greco in movie you haven't heard of part five <laughs> that has a car on the cover. <laughs> has a car, it's definitely a car and some sunglasses. Yes. Uh, okay, let's do at least one more here. Hey guys, love the podcast. What is a great movie with an overall disappointing villain that doesn't quite match the quality of the movie? 
Uh, this is a good example for him. Uh, the bad guys in Inception are a bit bland. Yeah. And then let's let's do this. Also, what are some terrible movies with awesome villains? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, for my great movie, Terrible Villain, I'm going to bring up a movie we just brought up a minute ago, and that's Moulin Rouge. Oh, oh. yeah. Now, Barrett doesn't like this movie, but I do. And uh, But the great, it's uh, got a terrible villain in it. Yep. And it's the Duke. And the Duke um is uh really the most one note uh bad guy you could ever have in a movie that is filled with so much color yeah um he is dumb just so (laughs) dumb clueless i mean yeah the most clueless person of all time and then you then you have to throw in all the like just the typical bad guy stuff and everything where like he literally has a mustache yeah he does that he can twirl yeah. and then like uh and then uh, there's a point where it's either implied or that it is it actually happens where he sexually assaults uh, satine mm-hmm. uh and uh and then yeah he doesn't he's very ineffective like the by by the end of it they're just just willingly just defying him out in the open not even caring what he can do like i guess they well maybe he might kill us or maybe they'll take away the you know the moulin rouge or something mm. they don't really care at yeah. the end and he get, tries to get some other dude to kill him and then by the time it's at the very end of it he's like you know very impotently shooting his gun and everything he's just a terrible terrible he is. part of that movie and I, just, I wish it could have just given him a little bit more of a dimension, especially in a movie with all that stuff going on. Yeah. Good call. Um, did you have one for the opposite? Uh, oh, yeah, I do. Uh, so, a, a terrible movie. movie with a great villain. I got two picks on this one. Uh, one is a movie uh, I have forgotten much about, and ironically, the movie is called The Forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that I remember about this, now the movie is about, so Julianne Moore believes that she has lost her child like eight years ago or some or or lost a child recently lost a child and then her psychologist tells her that all these memories she has that she thinks she has from the last eight years are not true that she made them all up uh of course she goes and tries to investigate and everything to find out what really happened and everything because she's she's pretty certain she had a kid Uh and uh and like so she finds this whole big conspiracy. It's like it's an alien conspiracy type things. Finds the the main guy who's played by Linus Roach in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, they have been kidnapping kids and then making the parents forget about them, which is a really cool, like I think a good cool thing in a movie. Yeah, but they just it just doesn't work now there is one moment in this that it like all the hair stood up on my body when this happened there's a part towards the end where she's like asking him like what do you want me to do or something like that and linus roach who's this alien guy is like want you to and the face just kind of slowly turns into this like i like eyeless demon thing and he's like for good <laughs> like like all this glass breaks and everything like, and like i just is so unexpected and everything <laughs> he's a great villain in this movie that just not memorable <laughs> yeah i've forgotten it but there's another one that i will add to this and that is the martians and mars attacks Oh yeah. oh yeah they're great yeah, yeah. those are the those are some funny motherfuckers act, 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 act. <laughs> is that a terrible movie yeah oh yeah, 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 yeah you can like still you can still enjoy it but it's yeah, terrible. It is I, terrible i enjoy it but it's terrible is it knowingly terrible or is it just terrible i think it's just terrible i think it turned into terrible on its way to trying to be knowingly terrible <laughs> <laughs> right it's it's a mix right like the it's it, it's based off of tops trading cards yeah this, we tried to make a terrible movie and accidentally became terrible. well he had just made ed wood remember and i think that he was trying to make kind of an ed wood type of movie yeah. but there you can't i don't know there's there's a lot of stuff in here that's just not funny and not presented well and right. everything you can't just make us something bad and say well that's what we meant yeah, yeah. you know so that's the way i feel about mars attacks yeah, yeah. there are moments in mars attacks that i love though yeah. 
the aliens are are the main part of it this especially when he's like ah, 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 and there's like the translator that's like you know stop we are your friends <laughs> and they're like shooting at yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right so uh for the first one good movie bad villain and i'm changing the definition because I, I didn't pick a stupendous movie mm-hmm. or a terrible one for either of the examples um guardians of the galaxy mm-hmm you remember anything about that guy? Nope. I remember that he was purple. <laughs> that's literally, and I think he was sent by Thanos to try and do something with right. the stone. But that's all I remember about that guy. I like that movie. Yeah. There but, are a lot of of people, the villains who blend together in those Marvel movies. Man, a lot of hooded figures, hooded <laughs> alien guys. <laughs> yes. You know, they. I was like, is that in the dark Thor: The Dark World, or is that in Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah. I don't know. It's all the same to me. Yeah. I yeah. remember he was purple. That's yeah. really it. Uh, and then for my uh, bad movie, good villain, I'm, so, I'm sort of cheating. Because it's not a bad movie, it's just okay. And that's The Devil Wears Prada. Because uh-huh. Meryl yeah. Streep fucking kills that role. Yes, she does. Kills it to the point where, I mean, I think Anne Hathaway's just fine. I think Emily Blunt's pretty good in it. Uh, but that movie doesn't work at all, even in a, on a basically charming level, if Meryl Streep isn't playing that role and just killing it mm-hmm. anyway and yeah. my wife lo- loves that movie so i've seen it plenty of times and that's why i, I chose that mm-hmm. uh here's how forgettable ronan the accuser the villain in guardians of the galaxy is he's not purple he's blue <laughs> <laughs> there you go and so it, it it's funny because it proves the point <laughs> But it still makes me look bad. All right. No, because uh, the Infinity Stone that he has is purple, and that's Close that's enough. how that that all works in. Okay, so for my great movie with the terrible villain, a very recent example, Ares from Wonder Woman. Oh yeah, yeah, good call. Forgettable in so many ways that he's telegraphed as the main baddie, but he doesn't really have a payoff because he's not really doing baddie shit throughout mm-hmm. the the movie. Then it's David Thewlis, God bless him, good actor, but like the God of War, seriously going up against Wonder Woman, just doesn't doesn't do it. Uh, that ending really really bothers me. Mm-hmm. A lot about that ending. I really think bothers it bothers me. a lot of people. I was I, Simpson and I talk on Twitter a lot, by the way. But we were talking about the parallels between that and Spider Man Homecoming, which, which are great movies, really enjoyable all the way through, but a kind of shitty final battle. Yep, and uh, you know it's kind of a a symptom. Like, I actually posed to him, maybe Logan is the only superhero film this year that has a satisfying final battle. Yeah, it really does. He liked Thor Ragnarok's final battle more than I did, but I still think that's kind of generic, even if you like it. Yeah. Um, so th- I think that's a struggle a lot of these superhero films have, is how do we end this? How, what, what do we do with this big battle now that we actually have a god and a princess god about to punch each other to the death? How do we make that interesting? <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, it, it's been going on since the end of Harry Potter. I mean, fucking Voldemort and Harry Potter are punching each other. Uh, well, with, with other. wands. Uh, no, literally punching each other at one point. Yep. When they're fallen. No, it's uh, when when uh, Voldemort disarms Harry and he's on the steps. Voldemort literally kicks him in the ribs a couple times. Oh, nice, nice, because that's what dark lords do. <laughs> yeah, that's what you can summon things without a wand. Anyway, uh, for and I'm also cheating a little bit because this isn't a terrible movie, but it's not a very good one. The Magnificent Seven remake. Oh, that came out. I believe that was this year, right? No, it was last, last year. Last year. Um, not the terrible movie, but certainly not good. And Peter Sarsgaard is kind of fun in this movie as a mm-hmm. villain. Like, he chews a lot of it up. He He's doing some sort of derivative of Heath Ledger and Johnny Depp and trying to make it look menacing. And I think for the most part, it succeeds. And uh, mm-hmm. so he's in a, in a movie full of stars like Ethan Hawke and Denzel Washington and Chris Pratt and all these guys. It's weird that Peter Sarsgaard would be like, you know, the, the thing that I most remember about that movie, but he is. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I still haven't seen it. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's a fun like Saturday afternoon movie. It feels so. like one of those movies when I see it on HBO, I'll be like, oh, I'll watch that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's it's not it's not bad. I mean, anytime you get to see Denzel, Denzel, I agree. It's always fun. I agree. Yeah. yeah. A lot of a lot of fun actors in that movie. Yeah. What line from a movie sounds like words of wisdom, but is it in actuality is nonsensical bullshit? Example mm. is seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm going to pick AFI's 13th all-time best line. Holy shit. 
Love means never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> ah, ah. From Love Story. Yeah. They say it twice in that movie. Allie McGraw says it to Ryan O'Neill, and Ryan O'Neill says it to some random at the end. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't under... And in the context of the movie, I don't know what they really are fucking... I mean, it's, they're both said after somebody says I'm sorry or whatever. But I feel like to me there that that seems to say that there's a standard by which you need to live by when you're in love with somebody that you never do anything that you have to be sorry for <laughs> right. or or that whatever you do that you feel sorry for is okay because the person loves you yes. and honey i cheated on you with two women at once but i'm not sorry yeah <laughs> because you love me because yeah love me don't even say it never having to say you're sorry um you know so yeah i feel like that's completely totally bullshit i don't know why the afi ranks that line so highly that is weird i guess it is because it is so famous but it's such bullshit yeah, yeah. that is bullshit yeah. i think mine might be on this afi list oh, too. Yeah? And i'm gonna piss some people off but i'm gonna go with do or do not there is no try uh, ah mm -hmm. fuck you yoda i can't <laughs> go from upsetting? do not to do if i don't try several times in between mm -hmm. <laughs> i've got uh, there also yoda is suggesting there is no value or merit in effort alone only in complete and total success. Right. That's some bullshit. <laughs> I mean, Yoda's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care that it works. And we quote this line like crazy, do or do not, there is no truth. Nobody would say that in real life. Like if your kid falls off a bike the first time he rides it, are you going to say, do it right next time or don't even try again? Right. But fuck that yeah it's terrible you made advice. a very good point and, and yeah. i understand the point i think what people are gonna more are gonna say about that line and i totally agree with you by the way i think that's bullshit but like the you know they're gonna say that it's it's not about you making the good college attempt or whatever it's about believing that you he can should have it. said don't ever be satisfied by just trying yeah. Right. Done. Yeah. Conveys right. the message he wants. Doesn't piss me it's off. It's not nearly as cool, though. <laughs> no, it, it's well, not nearly it's as, not cool as much line. Yoda speak. So you got to <laughs> try not. Anyway, go on. Nice. Uh, I've got a puny example relative to those very, very good ones. Always bothers me. I love me some Matrix. Yeah. But when Morpheus is showing Neo the, the real world for the first time, he's like, welcome to the desert of the real <laughs> <laughs> fuck you what the fu who fucking talks like that the desert of the real the desert of the real that seemed like the wachowskis were just like sitting around smoking a joint and they're like that's it right there we want to put that in lawrence fishburne's mouth so guys you're in this desert when the when the when the image shows up <laughs> and it's real and it's so full of self-importance and like you know lawrence fishburne being like i am showing you this it's the desert of the real Fuck. yeah yeah that's, yeah, that's a silly ass line no yeah. question that's yeah, my that's favorite bad. movie and i agree <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody uh, that'll do it for this week uh keep going to the syncast presented by cinema sins facebook page and giving you some giving us some comments go to soundcloud go to reddit go to the cinema sins twitter there are yeah. a lot of ways to contact contact us and get answers back you go to the u.s telegram office you can <laughs> send it western <laughs> union <laughs> how about uh, those facebook comments they're, they're pretty uh pretty insightful uh yeah there are a lot of good questions that i'm getting on facebook what's strange though and i don't know if it's the topics that we're covering or whatever but the first time we did this there were a million comments mm -hmm. and then it's sort of steadily gone down now i don't know if that's because i suck <laughs> i'm sure that's not it that's definitely not it or if it's that people are just rather not interact on facebook i don't know i understand that by the way mm -hmm. uh but uh but yeah come on to facebook and give me some comments yeah. i i answer almost every one of them yeah that's I pretty badass that. you do a pretty good job of that so mm -hmm. uh so yeah please go there but we also have other places you have the soundcloud and you have reddit you have uh simpsons twitter so there's a lot of different places to uh sound off about what we've said today so nice. anyway that'll do it for this week it'll be chris atkinson jeremy scott and barrett share we'll see you next time thanks for listening comment on our episodes on our soundcloud page check us out on youtube twitter facebook and reddit and be sure to visit cinemasins.com going to be a
I'm gonna be a zombie, a zombie caster. Zombie. Zombie. <laughs> zombie. A A. I told you what my brother used to say about her, right? That you could take her vocal track off and just pull a straw up and down in a McDonald's cup. <laughs> <laughs> and replace <it. laughs> That's totally That's zombies. That's totally absurd. What was the, it was, uh, their first song was Linger, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a great song. I like that song a lot. And then they did one more after Zombie. Oh, zombie all, was... all My Dreams. I, I didn't like that song. You're Children a dream to every me. Every day, yeah. every possible way. I liked that one all right. I guess she didn't do the uh, the whole like yodel thing on her other hits. No, it's really just that one. <sighs> <Man>. Zombie, zombie. <laughs> that song was everywhere too, man. Oh man, it was all over the place. It was like uh, Imagine Dragons Thunder right now. <sighs> Every fucking time I get in my car, it's that fucking weird ass solo thing in the middle of it. <laughs> it's like it's like it's mocking me. It's I, it's weird how a band like that, like every other song I love and then hate, like it, black or white with me in them. <laughs> Nothing in the middle. Feel the thunder. I really liked that uh, Make Me a Believer song. Did you really? Yeah. See, it, I like the radioactive song more. They all, they all sound very similar, though. I don't know. We were talking a podcast or two ago about how we can't tell them apart from 21 Pilots. <laughs> 21 Pilots, and what was the other one you were trying to think of? Fucking One Republic. Yeah, One Republic. Yeah. I, let me sing another One Republic song that sounds nothing like this song. Yes. <laughs> Let's do that again. Listen to that B.B. Rex, uh, Florida Georgia line song? No, but I somehow did manage to listen to a song with Haley Steinfeld and Florida Georgia line. Mm -hmm. At, is Florida Georgia line like a rapper now? They're just going to guest on mm -hmm. a bunch of tracks mm -hmm. and also this was seeing that video is the first time i'd ever seen what florida georgia line looked like yeah <laughs> i had no idea how kid rock with they were they're, they're like, grungy but their voices are good yeah i mean that first song of theirs that was a big hit that cruise yeah mm -hmm. which is not a bad song i guess if you're is that it. the one with nelly on it no the one uh baby you're a car make me want to yeah, roll my windows down and cruise. Yeah, something like that. That was just them. But then they did they did one with Nelly too. That's weird. Um, but, but no, if it's I mean, honestly, I'm this music video sin stuff is just jading me more and more. Every time a name comes in, like I basically have told myself I'm I'm not gonna listen to anything by somebody who names themselves BB Rexha. <laughs> Nelly was on the remix of Cruise. I think that's where it got it got like uh, really popular. But that BB Rex, I think the it's it's basically like a Tom Petty don't bore us get to the chorus thing. Okay. It's it's like a any Kelly Clarkson song where she just sings the chorus and there's like two words for a verse and then she moves on to the chorus. But this one has so many because the the refrain is like uh, if it was meant to be let it be let it be baby just let it be and they say be fifty one times in that song. Oh, and that's what the bonus round. <laughs> that's is. what the bonus round was. But when the way that they edited it. And all of the comments say this, like it's it's its own piece of music. <laughs> I think we it's might, like B B B B. I think we might have <laughs> a bonus round for Justice League of just utterances of the phrase "mother box." <laughs> <laughs> mm, mm. Because I felt like, I mean that that phrase had no mean. I'm, I'm going to save it for the pod. <sighs> but that phrase, they say that phrase probably fifty times in that movie. Mother box, mother boxes. Get to the mother box, cyborg. Mother boxes. <laughs> Take them apart, cyborg. <laughs> That's what I loved about the Deadpool two teaser. Did you see that? I didn't like that one. Oh, you didn't like it? Well, I just thought I it was just the, goofy. I liked it in general, but it felt like it felt like the jokes he was making were not clever. They were just gross. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna whack it off again. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. there's some of that in Deadpool, but the first I don't know they weren't. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, I don't. Know. I don't. Know. No, 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 no. I kind of have a bad feeling. I'm not gonna lie. Well, any of these sequels, man, they're gonna load up on everything the we did distilled. right the first time. Yep. Let's make him even more profane because the kids love people saying fuck. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Let's say fuck a lot. Indeed. Well, that's one of the reasons I can't get as into Big Lebowski as you guys, is that movie has way too many fucks in it. 
I wonder. Especially John Goodman. Every third word out of his mouth is some version of fuck. Yeah. And it gets to a point where I'm like, even people that say fuck all the time don't say it that often. What was the uh, the movie that has the most fuck? Is it Goodfellas? No. Um, I forget. Pulp Fiction is up there. It is. Yeah. I don't know which one. It, like, and Departed, then, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross is up there. Oh, uh, there's a ton of fucks in that. Yeah, I can't remember which one uh, does. It might be Goodfellas. Cause, it, I mean, it, just it because was in of, the running. Because just because of how many times someone gets real pissed off and it's like every other word, Joe Pesci especially. You know, fuck is the worst word that you can say. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is Wolf of Wall Street, probably because of the runtime. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if it's three hours, oh, su- Summer of Sam has four hundred thirty-five. God, I don't instances. remember that much. Jesus, uh, Wolf of Wall Street has five hundred and six. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I know that mid. That's, that's a lot of your screenplay, right? There. I know that Midnight Run had a lot too. <laughs> yeah. Midnight Run. It seems like every character in there is just trying to add more fucks every single time they say something. There's something called Swearnet the Movie that has 935 fucks, which I guess is the point of the movie. And then fuck a documentary on the word. Nah. Summer of Sam. Casino is up there. Martin Scorsese, man. Representing. Straight out of Compton. Length, and then Alpha Dog is up there. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. interesting. End of Watch. Sweet 16. Are they, And that's sheer number? Or is that sheer they number. just listing movies? Goodfellas is like in the top 15 with 300. So, so End of Watch had more than Goodfellas? Correct. I don't even remember, but you know, there's a lot of like, there's so many there's so many tiny scenes in End of Watch. Mm-hmm. They're just like these little vignettes and it jumps eight days and a lot of it's like criminals being arrested and mm-hmm. shit. It has 26 see. more fucks than Goodfellas. And it's way shorter. Yeah. Yeah. It's 109 minutes. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Fucks per capita. Yeah. There you go. That's something to research. So we're there. This is a naked episode. Naked, naked. All right. My we neck naked. is out. Sweet. <laughs> so everybody needs to strip down. Uh, I just picture Jason Siegel in the beginning of Forgetting Sarah Marshall. That's me right now. Mm. I don't want to go put clothes on. I know what happens if I go put clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> that means it's over. <laughs> I shouldn't say it'll get the nipples hard. It'll get the mm-hmm. it'll get the chill bumps going yes, like immediately. That it's should just, yeah. That should be cut out. <laughs> It does happen, though. It does. You're right. Jesus. That's one of the best un- unintentionally inappropriate things we've ever said. One of the Dylans is in this movie, I think. Dylans? Kevin like or Matt? Kevin or Matt's brother? No, I don't Steve. know. I, I, <laughs> I could, I, be, I could I, be wrong. I don't remember any of any Dylans. <laughs>